Okie dokie. Oh. A podcast for those addicted to the study of scripture. Welcome fellow addicts, this is your safe place to OD. Samuel! Here I am. What are we going to talk about today? Today we are continuing our journey through the Gospels. This is Gospels Part 77. Last week we saw where Jesus and his disciples had passed by the man that had been blind from birth, and the whole situation started off with the disciples asking Jesus, uh, well, who sinned, like this guy or his his parents? Uh, We looked at the Jewish cultural idiom that sinfulness and bad things happening to you may or may not have some correlation, and Jesus responds by not even answering either one of those options and says that it's the works of God are going to be displayed, uh, yeah. this man's condition in his healing later. And Jesus tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam after giving him a little mud bath, so to speak. <laughs> um, and he was healed. And, man, we go from neighbors not neighbors who are around him regularly saying that they don't believe that that's him they don't recognize him then the pharisees that people bring him to the pharisees because they're all up in arms about jesus doing this which we later find out is on the sabbath and the the formerly blind guy i mean he holds his own he claps back at the pharisees and uh stands (laughs) his ground about his testimony and what had happened and saying that this guy has to be of spiritual significance within God's narrative because of what he had done from for a guy that had been blind from birth. So at the end of that sticking it to the man, (laughs) he really was. (laughs) Um, Yeah, but they, they ended it. The story that we ended casting him out because they were using their authority of being um, amongst the Pharisees to totally discredit anything he was saying regarding Jesus' testimony, and they cast him out, and that's where we left off. Yeah, and I mean, you know, it sounds bad they cast him out, but in some sense you're going, well, good for that guy. Mm -hmm. He didn't have to hang around with them anymore, right? All right, well, let's then let's see what happens, because the story, I mean, there's more to go. We had a good stopping point last time, but more to go. What do we got here? Uh, John chapter 9, verses 35 to 41. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, We see, your guilt remains. All right. Now, to be fair, I don't know about you, but if I was standing around, I'd be going, Jesus, come on now. You're just being contrary. You're just uh, this kind of gobbledygook. What are you saying here? What, what's going on, right? You could see why an ordinary person might not find this to be too compelling, let's say. But let's get in and see what's being said, because I I think it's actually really good. So, first of all, (laughs) again, things that make Paul laugh, this seems to be similar to some things we've already seen in the the stories we've covered so far in the podcast. So, let's, let's recount. Jesus heals a guy and then just lets him deal with the consequences of it. 
Now, as you mentioned, Samuel, this guy was kind of feisty. He held his own pretty well. But Jesus, he comes back and he talks with the guy. And in this case, and I know we it kind of sounds like we're joking and we kind of sort of are because it's a situation we can't actually relate to. But in, on the other hand, it's not a joke at all. This is just uh, observation. The guy has no idea that he's talking to Jesus. Why? Because he was blind. Everybody he meets, or, or I mean, certainly almost everybody he meets, they had to be someone new to him. He didn't know them before. Now, obviously, you know, there are those that he would have had relationship, whether family, friend, whatever. And I'm sure he would recognize them and just be amazed at how they looked, how they appeared. But for everybody, else, everybody was new. Everybody knew. But this is, this is good. Jesus, he hears that the guy has been cast out. This is cast out from the Pharisees, cast out from their little meeting. Maybe it's a court-like thing or whatever. And this is a, it's a likely indicator that the guy had, at least in some measure, proclaimed Jesus to be from God or the Son of God or, I don't know, something important. Remember, he said the prophet or a prophet. And now, maybe Jesus had supernatural insight to this, but that wasn't exactly necessary just the way that the guy got cast out, Jesus could make some sort of inference, some sort of assumption that the guy must have been sticking up for him. So, so Jesus asks him if he actually believes in the Son of Man. Now, some, some manuscripts uh, have Son of God, some have Son of Man, and I don't even mean translations, I mean underlying manuscripts, it just depends on which ones they are. And it's kind of weird because th- imagine this guy. When you are a blind beggar, you are in some sense an outcast of society. Not entirely, but you know, pretty much. Would he even have had a really good grasp of what the phrase son of man meant? Maybe, but maybe not. Son of God might have been a little bit easier for the guy to grasp onto. I mean, he certainly, I guess he could have gone to synagogues and things. He wouldn't have been prevented from that, but he couldn't go to the temple. But this other phrase, son of God, it's kind of at once a little bit odd because Jesus has said son of man so many times, but it actually sort of fits better with the preceding story. So it's hard to say. Anyway, just an interesting textual thing. But the man seems very eager. And, you know, you might start to suspect maybe he does think that this might be Jesus, but he doesn't say it. He wants to know. He asks the question, you know, who are you or who, where is he that I might, you know, meet him or worship him or whatever. He wants to know who he is so that he can believe. And I think sort of hidden underneath that is a very simple truth. You have to know something of who he is. Like, you don't have to know him in his his entirety because we spend our whole lives doing that. But you have to have some idea. You must know who he is to truly believe. And I would say that the more you know him, the more you are able to believe. And that's just another motivating reason to to pursue him, the kingdom, etc., more and more. But anyway, Jesus... You know, he's his cool way, you know, uh, who is he? And, and Jesus is like, you've seen him. Of course, only just now, right at this moment, so as far as we know. And he's speaking to you. And so it's kind of a big reveal. And imagine you're that guy. I mean, already you've had a pretty darn big day or week. We don't know how much time has passed. You used to be a blind beggar, and now you can see. But can you even imagine what this guy's feeling Right at this moment, because this is the guy. This is the guy that made the mud, wiped it on his eyes, told him to go wash. The the overall focus of this part of the story is seeing or sight. But we're not just talking about physical. The conversation is going to get interesting. It's talking some about physical sight and some about spiritual sight. But we see in Jesus' words that... 
this idea of seeing or recognizing and the idea of hearing and obeying are the key. You've seen him and he's speaking to you. It's seeing and hearing, recognizing and obeying. That's key. And this is a consistent story throughout all the scriptures, which if you were reading this under any other circumstance, you wouldn't think anything of it. But because that's such a consistent story in the scriptures, it's it's interesting to point out that that's what Jesus is saying right here. So we shouldn't miss it. This reveal is also similar to what happened back at the woman of the well. And I know you remember that, Samuel. We just talked about it recently. This is back in John 4, verse 26. But here's the thing. Jesus, he seems to be quick to reveal who he really is to the outcast. Mm. When he's around those who should know him, should recognize him, should be joyous at his presence, everything, and they don't recognize him, he seems to be like, he leans more and more and more toward hiding or or something, deflecting something, whatever. But when they're outcast, he's quick to go, hey, this is who I am. So I just think that's a cool picture. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So we see the man's response. Okay, in some sense, it's maybe one of the best ones we've seen. I mean, as soon as he finds out, wait, you're the guy? Boom. Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. And in some sense, it's so matter of fact, makes it sound so simple, but it's a big deal. And it portrays a great truth. When you really see him, when you really hear him, and again, when you know him, you believe. And by the way, this word worship, just a little side note, many, many times when we're reading scriptures, that word worship is very particularly referring to sacrifices in the temple. That's what worship was. But it also could be applied like you see here. It's merely the idea of to to kneel or bow down so so that sort of worship. And that's what he's talking about here. The guy didn't go off and, and do a sacrifice, although maybe for the first time in his life, life he could have. But in this case, we're just talking about bowing down kind of thing. But he did it. Immediate submission. You, you are Lord. I, I just think that's beautiful. Mm. Anyway, but then, <laughs> I don't know if you caught this when we were reading it, Samuel. Jesus says, he came into the world for judgment. Didn't he say somewhere recently that he didn't come into the world for judgment? Well, even John the writer in chapter 3, the big, you know, famous verse 316, later in that chapter it says that yeah. God didn't come to condemn the world, but to save it. Yeah, and that's, it, it's it's so common, but here Jesus is saying that he came into the world for judgment. But we know in other places, he says that he didn't come into the world for judgment. So which is it? And this is, of course, the famous joke answer. Yes, he came not to perform actual judging. And and I'm talking like the life or death kind of stuff. You are in the book of life. You are in the book of death. You know, I don't know. We might think of it as white robe, big gavel. I don't know, something. So he didn't come for that. That is for later when he returns after the kingdom, all that. But he did come, and I, we could say it different ways, but I, I think of it as like, it's like he's illuminating the hearts of men to enable judgment so that they can be seen more clearly. It, clearly, it makes the state of a man clear so that their judgment, it isn't really going to be a mystery. It's going to be, you know, kind of obvious. The judgment is not only going to be true, but it's going to be obvious and clear. And, the, you know, part of the beauty of that is that you can see it and choose your path, or I guess the better thing would be to change your path. So so it's a good thing. So he came into the world for judgment or to enable judgment, I guess, if we were going to try to paraphrase it. 
And I don't know, I think it's just another way of God showing mercy in the middle of all this. So it's kind of a big deal because his chosen people are in the midst of rejecting him right now for, you know, practical purposes, and God's still showing mercy. It's just amazing. Mm -hmm. But then the big bomb drop. Jesus came so that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. And so I think it's at this point we can safely say we've left the physical realm. This is very much a spiritual idea. But those who actually recognize and acknowledge that they are without truth, meaning they are blind, they know that they're blind, and they humbly seek and receive instruction, they're they're seeking to see, well, they they actually you know, they're going to see it. They're going to accept the truth, including the fact that he is the Messiah. So they they will see. But in this, we also see the symbolism of a world that's in, in darkness receiving the light. Remember how we talked about that earlier? Jesus was saying that he is the light of the world, that kind of stuff. So you kind of see it. These people are in darkness. They do not see, but they are able to receive the light. However, there are those who think they see. Now you gotta you gotta imagine, I mean, surely some are right. I mean, we're not saying that everybody is is self-deceived or, or deluded or whatever, but of those, there are many who think they see. And they only have a couple of choices before them. They either need to become like the blind, meaning they have to wake up and recognize that they're without the truth, they're blind, they have to humbly seek, receive instruction, or well, they can just remain in their error, in their arrogance, and come to an end of utter darkness. And you can go ahead and say, ouch, now, because yeah. <laughs> that's pretty rough. And and I don't know, in some way, that interpretation, it, it gets made clearer as we continue. But, I mean, that's what it's talking about, this, this idea of those who can't see, see, and those who see become blind, whatever. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. Now, the Pharisees... Go ahead. Oh, I'm just going to say that verse c- could potentially get really sticky, especially if you're someone who has some previous knowledge about competing theologies, especially in the Western world of the church. Um, and I, d- I definitely don't want our podcast and our content to suggest that um, – Jesus came into the world to only give sight to some and not to others. Like I, I feel like the language that Jesus is implying is not like who's in and who's out. It's like Jesus can see the heart of all and those yes. who are wanting more for their lives, wanting to seek uh, what true life actually lo- looks like for living, that he's going to give you that sight. But those who are not interested in that, pursuing their own thing. It, it's kind of like the way that God treated Abr- uh, treated a Pharaoh in the Exodus. Like, God is going to help you get what you actually want, in his case, like yeah. hardness of heart. Yeah. You want it, and, and you're actually having trouble, you know, sticking by your guns, so I'll even help you a little bit. <laughs> It's it's that's a funny picture, very strange, but yeah, I think you're right, Samuel. Uh, there's nothing about this that is you know suggesting that there are two classes of humans, those who are in and those who are out, and there's nothing that can be changed about that. This is, hey, there is a choice before you. You choose this path, and you know what? You may be out of the picture right now, but you can be right back in. You just got to get off your high horse and see what's really in front of you. So that's good. Good. Now, the Pharisees, it says that they're nearby. They heard what he said, and and they knew exactly what he meant, or certainly the, the basic idea of what he meant. And so they're like, oh, I get it. So so we're the blind ones, right? That kind of thing. But Jesus explains, if if only they were blind, you know, sort of like in the humble and ignorant sense, well, then they wouldn't have to bear the guilt of their rejection of him. 
But that's the problem. They weren't blind in that way. They thought they they could see. And this is, it's funny, there's a... It, this this whole story, it's like a great turnaround has happened right here in John chapter 9. So in John chapter 9, right back at the very beginning, like verse 1 or 2 or whatever it was around there, there's this, the, the question, who sinned that this man was born blind? That's where this all started versus where we are now. If only they were blind, they would have no sin. Isn't that crazy? I mean, that's like just a massive switch of change, which again, John, utter genius. It's just great. Or Jesus, maybe he planned all these stories in order so that John would write it. I don't know, whatever. It's just cool. But as it stands, their arrogance, their belief that they did see, understand, know God, the scriptures, and their rejection of him, which, I mean, it's like a physical manifestation of those same scriptures standing right in front of them in the person of Jesus, and they're rejecting it. It makes their guilt, their sin, undeniable and unavoidable. And at least as it was stated in this chapter, they will not inherit the kingdom. So this is, it's good stuff, but it's rough stuff. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it's easy to look at the Pharisees or the people that are, you know, his opponents at any given moment in time. But man, we need to be more ready, more willing to say, hey, how much am I like that guy? I mean, I, I think I'm okay. I think I'm cool. But am I really? You know, that self-reflection, it's a, it's a hard thing, but it's a necessary thing. We got to do it over and over and over and over. Mm-hmm. All right. Big ending. We're just going on chapter 10? I think so. We're good? <laughs> All yeah. Right. <laughs> All right. So continuing, we're still in the book of John, and we're going to go through chapter 10. Uh, we're starting now John chapter 10, verses 1 through 6. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them but they did not understand what he was saying to them. All right. John refers to this as a figure of speech. Others try to call it a parable. Others try to, you know, whatever. Let's just go with John's definition. He certainly knows more than us. But this is a really interesting little story. And I don't know about you, Samuel, but if you think about it enough, you kind of get stuck going, Wait a second. Who's who? Now, we've done this before when we're trying to look at parables and we're trying to figure out what does this person represent or what does this thing represent or whatever. So we're going to try to do it with this as well. Just the the basic outline. Uh, There's a doorkeeper or a gatekeeper. All right. So that's one person. And there is a shepherd. And, okay, we're told that the doorkeeper recognizes the shepherd and opens the door for him. Okay, and then there are sheep, and and it's the shepherd's sheep, his sheep, and they're they're no one else's. They recognize him, they follow him, they know his voice. But then there's this other one. There's the one who he avoids the door. He avoids the door, the doorkeeper, the gatekeeper. He tries to go in a different way. And what is he trying to do? He's trying to get to the sheep. And then we're told, you know, the shepherd's sheep don't follow him because they don't know 
his voice, right? They recognize the shepherd's voice and follow the shepherd. So that man, if he's somehow made it in with the sheep, he's got the sheep, whatever it is, that man is a thief and a robber. So on the surface, again, we can see the picture that's being painted. That's not too complicated. But when you try to step back and you're trying to figure out what does it mean, well, the people listening to him, the religious leaders, common Jews, we we don't even really know who his audience is right at this moment. Apparently, they do not understand. And and we, (laughs) with all the benefit of scripture and technology and everything, we ought to understand it, but it's still kind of hard to figure out who's who. So the thief and the robber, that one's probably pretty easy. You got a guess on that one, say, uh, <laughs> Samuel? <laughs> Almost called you Satan. <laughs> I'm going to go with Samuel. <laughs> you don't like that nickname? Yeah. <laughs> so who's the thief and the robber? Your uh, guess? <laughs> the Satan, the enemy. Yeah. That's right. It's probably Satan. You could say other things. You might say false teachers, or you might say the Jewish leadership that's been in these stories or whatever. But you get it. It's the bad guy. And then the sheep, you got a guess on that, Samuel? Uh, to be like the nation of Israel? Yeah, exactly. The Jewish people. That they're, they're the sheep. And then the sheep fold, well, that, that's basically this world. It's it's and I mean we could be more explicit about it. this is the the corrupt world of sin and death that we live in right but yeah the sheepfold is the world it's where they're where they're currently being contained but the shepherd is going to come in and take them out to the pasture so if this world currently is the sheepfold what might the pasture be Samuel uh, the redemption of the corrupt world of death so like the messianic kingdom that messiah is bringing into the world yeah the point of all of this the kingdom so that's what the pasture is and then here's where it gets tough so all of those things i mean i think we're in the ballpark on all of those those are helping us making the picture better and and as you can see we haven't been saying it but all of the parables pretty much are pointing to the kingdom in some way but now we get down to the door or the doorkeeper and the shepherd they kind of both sound like Jesus, don't they, Samuel? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and 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 or, or God, or whatever. I mean, it's it's hard to figure it out. If only there was someone who could explain just a little something more about this parable to us, maybe we could figure it out. But there isn't, so let's just go on. <laughs> John chapter ten, verses seven through ten. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Well, there's our answer. Jesus is the doorkeeper, or the door, even. And then you step back and you go, all right, well, then who's the shepherd? Well, who's left? It's God. God is the shepherd. So, okay, now we can actually understand his figure of speech or parable or whatever, better. So uh, we can see the underlying message is that Jesus is the way to God, the way to life. And I guess you could think of it as kind of a two-way street, but whatever, you get the idea. For But it's important. It's for those who actually belong to God, his sheep. Now, Samuel, I don't know if you'll know this. I'm guessing you will. If there was some sort of sheepfold that a shepherd was using, do you think it's possible that it was being used by more than one shepherd for more than one flock of sheep? That seems possible. Yeah, and it totally was. And so there's that picture of mankind on earth. 
Some of them are gods and some of them are not. So if Jesus is our entry and exit point and, and it's, it's, it's him, but, but it's like his teaching, his example, then we've got safety and green pastures ahead. In fact, we have life even. And, you know, according to the end, not just life, but abundant life. So I don't know. I think that's a super cool image. But since God is the shepherd, well, then the thieves and robbers are those who put themselves in the place of God and try to shepherd the people. Does that make sense? If you're the bad guy who was trying to skirt the door and the doorkeeper, what were you trying to do? You were trying to get at the sheep. You were trying to be a shepherd, but who was the shepherd? God. So you're trying to take his place in shepherding the people. Now, let's talk practically. You're walking around in first century Israel. Who are the shepherd shepherds of the people? It's the Jewish leadership. It's the scribes, Pharisees, those who are in charge, the, the, even the priesthood in some, some cases. And it's not all of them, but some of them, they are trying to shepherd the people, but they're not doing it the right way. In fact, they're, they're trying to, to find a way around the door and the doorkeeper, Jesus. And so this is, this story is, is, it's a, a, a shot to the heart of the leadership in Israel. So if they're understanding what he's saying, this is like, this is something that make you mad. So uh, anyway, these shepherds, they're not good shepherds. They steal from the sheep for their own use. They kill the sheep for their own use. They destroy the sheep. And honestly, that's kind of like for no use whatsoever. It's just dumb, but they're not good shepherds. And so Jesus says that all that came before him, meaning in time, those who were here before me, trying to play this role before me. They're thieves and robbers. Now, there were many in Israel's history that acted as what we would think of as the door or the doorkeeper, or maybe even the shepherd. Uh, Now, Samuel, were they all bad? Definitely not. Yeah. I mean, what about Moses? Was he bad? No, he was awesome. The prophets? Mouthpiece of God. They weren't all bad, but there were bad ones, you know, pretty much all along. And it seems that we're not supposed to take the word all literally. And, you know, we've talked about that a lot. That happens. So who does he mean? Well, it's definitely those who take on the role of shepherding his people. Now, in this particular case, it's Israel. But today we could bring that out into, you know, all the different ways this affects the Gentiles as well. But it's it's the ones that the sheep are either listening to or, you know, they don't know who else to hear or whatever. Now, in in the story, they recognize, you know, the shepherd's voice. And so these are ones who, I don't know, maybe they've been tricked or they've gotten used to this stranger, whatever it might be, right? But they're supposed to enter by the door, which is Jesus, which is, I'm just going to say, another another way of saying Torah. But it's those who didn't enter by the door. They were supposed to but they didn't. And so they're thieves and robbers. And one important thing, we're not going to get too deep into it, but it's really important for you as a listener, maybe to go check this out. You know, we, we offer suggestions a lot of time. Oh, you can go see this here. You can go see this here. This is one you really should go look because this is, this is good. It's the best way of understanding, at least I think, what Jesus is actually getting at. So God speaks of his sheep and he's talking about bad shepherds, and he declares that he will be their shepherd. This is back in Ezekiel chapter 34. He declares he will be their shepherd, but he also declares that he will set a shepherd over them, one from the line of David. Now, you might be thinking, hey, wait a second, that sounds a lot like Jesus but didn't we just say that Jesus was the door? Well, yeah, we did. But wait till you see what's coming. Jesus is going to continue now with more talk, more parables, whatever. (laughs) You ready, Samuel, or you got something? No, I just, John, the writer, has 
left the narrative that was nice and smooth in the previous story, and now we're getting into all the super tough stuff again. Yeah, but, you know, you've got it. You know what the parable was. We broke down the component parts. We know who's who, or we thought we did. I mean, we had a good indicator. We understand the message behind it, and we can see more of this image back in Ezekiel 34. So now let's move on. John chapter 10, verses 11 through 16. And just as a reminder, this is Jesus talking. I am the good shepherd. (laughs) The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. Oh, Samuel, this is so good. All right, but let's get back to the funny part. So remember, we were all excited because we were like, I don't know, who's the door? Who's the shepherd? Whatever. Oh, thank goodness. Jesus is the door. God's the shepherd. Oh, surprise. Jesus is a shepherd too. (laughs) But this actually fits because what did we just talk about from Ezekiel 34? God said that he would be their shepherd, but he also said that he would set a shepherd over them. So this is so great. Jesus is the door and he's also the shepherd, the one that God, the true shepherd has set over his people. It's so good. So God's a shepherd. He puts Jesus over. Ezekiel 34, such a great connection. You got to love it. But then Jesus speaks in, you know, something more parable-like, I guess, language. He draws a clear distinction between the owner of the sheep, and he's referring to him as the good shepherd, and the hired hands. So they're, they're acting in the role of shepherd, but they're only a hired hand. They are the thieves and the robbers that we just talked about. And if we take it out into practical terms, these are the religious leaders in Israel. They're not the real shepherd, the true shepherd, the good shepherd. They're not the owner. They're just a hired hand. Isn't that an amazing connection? Mm. Amazing image? But, you know, and he says it, the hired hand, he's quick to abandon the sheep for his own sake, his own life, his own good. He cares more about himself than he does the sheep. And so Jesus is pointing this out. This is present in the leadership in Israel right here, right now in front of their eyes. And to be fair, it represents many from the past also. So you got this good shepherd and he describes him as the good shepherd is one who's willing to lay down even his own life for the sheep. Now, before we jump to it, because I know everybody's thinking one name. Also, just think back, just one example from the Old Testament, David, before he became king, before all of that stuff with his life started, he was a shepherd. And we got to hear the stories. He had to fight off lions and bears. He's a young man, probably a teenager or less. And he is fighting off lions and bears with a slingshot. That is a shepherd who is willing to lay down even his own life Mm. for his flock. But of course, we always think of Jesus because what did he do? He laid down his life, right? So the sheep know him and he knows them. It's easy to imagine that. And, And of course, you know, if we're talking about Jesus, he's reiterating that he lays down his life for the sheep. And in hindsight, We think of the cross, easy connection, but his audience here, okay, probably not so much. 
Remember, this, none of this has happened in their world, so it might not be as easy for them to quite understand the fullness of who Jesus is and what he is about to do. Uh, but anyway, we know Jesus is going to lay down his life for Israel, and, and it says that he lays down his life for his sheep. And so, you know, we speak of it as, well, it's, it's universal in its potential, but there are some who won't benefit. Uh, you know, it's their own fault, but he's doing it for the ones who will, in fact, follow him, recognize his voice, etc. So, I don't know, it's kind of cool. Uh, and then, oh, Samuel, this is so good. Uh, I actually had someone say this to me recently. I can't remember who or where it was or whatever, but it, you know how things just really catch your attention? They made a comment that that basically made it sound like Jesus had nothing to do with Gentiles. Everything that he was talking about was about Jews and Jews alone. And, and we are so lucky that we have Paul because Paul is the one that brought all of this stuff to the Gentiles. Now, we all know that there is a measure of truth to that. Jesus was definitely focused on Israel. No question about that. But look what Jesus says here. He has other sheep, not of this fold. Well, this fold is Israel. So who are these other sheep? They're the nations. Jesus is talking about it. He's predicting it. He knows it. He knows the full story. He has other sheep, not of this fold. And now we could... We could talk about the exiles of Israel, and there's truth in that. that no, no question. That's good. Um, they're all going to be reunited, but it definitely goes beyond that. You can easily see. And of course, for us, it's hindsight, but he's speaking of Gentiles. He's speaking of the nations. Jesus is declaring that he must bring them to, that they will also listen to his voice. Some of them, not all of them. They will hear. They will obey. And finally, Jesus says, and this is, it's so good, they will all make up a single flock under one shepherd. It's exactly what Paul is saying in all of his writings. We kind of mess it up a little bit, but that's what Paul is saying. There is one shepherd, Jesus, and one flock, Israel, and that other flocks will be added to the first, they will be grafted in, is some of the language Paul used. So Israel and the nations, a single flock under their shepherd Jesus, not every single Israelite, just the sheep among the Israelites, the believers, the obeyers, the remnant, we would say. Not every person of the nations, but the sheep, the believers, the obeyers. This is the culmination of that promise to Abraham. And Jesus just said it himself right there. It's my silence is just indicative of Jesus incorporating this that I'd not even re- realized until you pointed it out now. Like I, I always, I mean, and we've talked about it before how Jesus' primary role for his ministry was to witness to the covenantal people, the Jewish people, but it's just amazing to to find these little nuggets hidden within his words that he he had a plan for people like you and I who are are not Jewish as well. Yeah, it's I think it's just phenomenal. Blows me away. What we really need, you know, there's a mind blown emoji. <laughs> we need something that communicates that with audio. Um, I did want to ask really quickly, um, his statement at the beginning of this section, chapter 10, verse 11, I am the good shepherd, with our previous knowledge that you brought up with Ezekiel 34 about God being seen as a shepherd, would Mm -hmm. the audience of this parable, would, would that have, could that have been seen as him saying, I am God? type statement mm-hmm. uh because i mean, I know we've already been through the 6th chapter of John where 
the whole yeah. issue with the bread of life was him coming down and like, oh, like only God is the one who comes down from heaven to earth. And I just wondered if, is there a parallel here with him saying that he is a good shepherd and people would respond to like, wait, I thought only God the Father was our shepherd. And this guy's saying that he's a shepherd? Is he saying that he's God? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I hadn't considered that for myself. And I think... I think your your point is valid. Your question is valid. It's really, really good. The only thing that I could say in response is that they don't seem to get too upset. I mean, we'll read the next bit. They're kind of like, oh, you know what? Just shut up and get out of here, which is very different from, I'm going to kill you, blasphemer, you know? Mm-hmm. So I don't, I don't know. It, it doesn't seem that they heard it that way, but it's a really good point. It's a really good point. I don't know. But again, back in Ezekiel 34, it's part of the message is that God is the shepherd and he's going to set one over. So that's how they even knew they were looking for someone from the line of David, all that kind of thing. So I don't know. I don't know. It's a great question. I just don't have an answer. It's all good. Yeah. Now you got my mind reeling. We need that audio mind blown. No. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, we got a couple little bits. Let's go ahead and fit them in before we're done. And then we can say we're done in John for a while, which I don't know. Call it good news. Call it bad news. Uh, whatever. But here we go. John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. For this reason, the father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Okay, now, I get it. Sometimes you read stuff like that, and it's it's hard to stay really connected because it feels, oh man, what, what are you saying? Just be clearer. But this this is so amazing and so good. Jesus is talking. He's, God loves me because I am willing to do this thing. Okay, so what is that thing? To lay down my life. And 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 why why would I even be willing to do that? Because I could take it up again. Which it, it's like it is the story of the victory over death. So God loves me because I'm willing to do it. I'm going to lay down my life. But more than that, this is so important to see. On one hand, God commanded him to do it. But on the other hand, God gave Jesus the authority over his own life. So think about that for a second. God commanded Jesus but he still gave Jesus the option. Jesus could have chosen to preserve his own life. It was within his authority. And we see the struggle in the Garden of Gethsemane later. God, if possible, could you please not make me go through this? I don't want to. I don't want to. But, but not my will. Your will be done. Jesus had that authority, but he chose to lay it down. Now, you could say, well, but at least he knew he had the authority to take his life up again, effectively defeating death. Yeah, but I don't know. It was probably still pretty hard to do. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I just think it was. So he, he is the good shepherd. Being the good shepherd, he was willing to lay down his life for the sheep. And in the end, the sheep get the good shepherd, if you will, Jesus, and I guess ultimately when he hands it all back, then God, they get the good shepherd forever. So I don't know. It's kind of cool. I like that little bit. Yeah, there is one thing in this section that I'm kind of stumbling over in Jesus's words um, that's with, in the middle of verse 18 where he says, mm-hmm. I have authority to lay it down and I have yeah. the authority to take it up again. Mm-hmm. Is G- It almost comes across like Jesus is saying that he has, uh, 
how do I want to say it, the power within himself to resurrect himself. But I've always treated Jesus' resurrection as like it was Jesus' perfect obedience and like God, his father, rewarded him with life because he didn't deserve death. He, he only deserved life. So what is this statement? How does that fit into that larger concept of God and Jesus, their relationship when it comes to his death, his later death and resurrection? Yeah. And you know what, Samuel, that is that is a difficult, difficult question because, OK, on one hand, I mean, it's just going to be such a hard conversation. On one hand, we know that in some sense, everything has its source in God. And and we also know, I mean, we've already read statements in the reading we've done so far, and, and you know, uh, we can't just live in a vacuum. We know from the rest of the scriptures, things like that, Jesus is God in the same way that the Holy Spirit is God, in the same way that, you know, the Word that interacts in creation is God, Jesus is the Word, all that. We know that too, and yet we also know that Jesus he he acts uh in submission toward god he 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 follows the father's will he treats himself at least uh, certainly while he's walking around as a human treats himself as separate or distinct in some way i don't know if separate people probably don't like that word but you know a distinct person if you will and so it complicates this whole thing so, so then to back to your question you start talking about the resurrection it's like well who resurrected him I mean, did God do it or did Jesus do it himself or, you know, whatever. And it makes this so hard. So I don't think I'm going to give you a satisfactory answer, but I am going to say God is the one who, and I don't even know if these are the right words, if we could say it this way, because it's so outside our realm of understanding. God is the one who performed the resurrection. He was raised by God. But then you say, but Jesus is God. And, and there are, there is a couple of spots in the scriptures where it seems to suggest that he raised himself. Well, how do you do that if you're dead? Right? And it's like, well, but we understand what death is. Death was separation from his physical body. And so maybe, you know, in his, uh, floaty spirit self, you know, <laughs> The one that was separated from his body at the time of death, is it possible that he did do it himself? You know what? Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. The The whole thing is very complicated, and I can't tell you, no, 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 no. Seriously, dude, this is the way it worked. I don't know. So, and then we also, I'm sorry, there's one other thing I was going to add. This idea, remember, uh, do we have to wait till we get to Acts before he says this? Or I can't remember right off the top of my head, but Jesus makes some comment like, all authority has been given to me, right? All authority in heaven and earth. So now we got that, and we got the idea that Jesus is going to hand it all back to the Father at some point. And so, when did Jesus have all that authority? Did he have it? before he died and so then when he died he was able to raise himself up or did god raise him up and give him all that authority or does i I don't know i don't know it's very confusing but everybody listening to the podcast is now going well that's dumb now i just have more questions (laughs) (laughs) oh it's i don't know anything that i said did you have any thoughts anything that clarified it for you or just other thoughts that you had that maybe add to it whatever uh I mean, I don't, I wouldn't say that I have resolution about it. I guess I came into my wrestling with this statement of Jesus with this continuing journey that I'm trying to prioritize when I'm thinking and considering about Jesus, where I'm not so focused on the God goggles aspect of him because, like, I want, I want his death to have weight to it and that like there there were consequences with his actions in yeah <clears throat> what what his death could have resulted in whether it's life and abundance for overflowing to us here now and all generations or if like what you said uh the option to preserve his life like he had the 
the freedom to do that, which would have changed the course of, you know, with the spiritual reality for the whole world as well. So I guess, I don't know, it, it, it feels, my personal opinion, it feels a little anticlimactic for Jesus to just do it himself, I guess, because yeah, th- yeah, then you get into that weird situation of like, well, if he if he has the authority to bring it up again, he could just do whatever he wants, and then at the end he just he has the authority to take it up and says, you know, well, I'm God, but I don't know. I just <laughs> I don't yeah, know, this is a hard one. <laughs> yeah, well, the one silver lining to that last little bit you said, let let's say that he really did. It was like all within his own power. He could die. He could raise himself up. Whatever. Just he could do whatever he wants. Okay, but. He still must remain in perfect sync with God's will. So he can't just do whatever he wants and and remain obedient. So so there is that aspect. But yeah, I don't know, Samuel, that was a toughie. And uh, I'm glad you brought it up. And I'm just, you know, sometimes things, they're just, they're just mysteries. They're, they're difficult to, you know, I don't know really what that's saying right there but got people listen you could send us the answer okidokimos at gmail.com yeah we're not too proud (laughs) you think you got it figured out lay it on us we'd love it but hey let's try and get this finished up there's only just a few verses so let's do that and and then we can move on to a new section next episode john chapter 10 verses 19 to 21 There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, He has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? And others said, These are not the words of one who's oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? So, Sort of continuing the theme we've seen in this most recent chapter, Je- uh, Jesus is causing, you know, more division among the people. Some are liking what they're hearing, some are not. And then you have some, they just don't want to hear anymore. And they, they first, they say he has a demon. And you remember uh, when we said before that it, it's kind of a, like in modern terminology, that's where we would just go, man, you're crazy, mm-hmm. right? You're just, you're not talking sense, you're, you're being weird, whatever. They associated that with demonic oppression, okay? So it's it's not to say that they weren't being somewhat literal, but to associate it with modern lingo, there's that. But notice what they said. He has a demon and is insane. And so, well, what does that mean? You just said, you know, that it's, that it's like having a demon is being insane or whatever. Well, that insane part, that's actually talking about someone who, and, and I'm sure in some either in real life or on movies, TV, something, you've seen someone who is, they're raving or they're raging. They're acting, you know, as if they are in fact mad in some way. So, so it's like, you're, you're talking crazy. You're not making any sense. And you're actually acting like you've gone mad in some way, right? Those are the two words they're using. Anyway, it doesn't matter. These are his, his uh, detractors. They don't like him. They've heard enough. And then, of course, you have the other, uh, the other half, or I don't know what the ratio was. Others, they, they may or may not have truly grasped what Jesus was saying. We can't be sure about that, but they did know. They recognized, you know what? This, this isn't this isn't the way a madman talks. That's silly. That's not what this is. They'd seen or heard about the, him opening the eyes of a man who was blind from birth. They're listening to his words, and you know what? This is just not the kind of stuff. That demons do. It's not the kind of stuff that crazy people do. It's not the kind of stuff that whatever. He was, Jesus was winning some of them over. And I'm just going to go back to this again because it's important. Remember, this is that last festival of Sukkot. They're down around Jerusalem. This was Jesus in some way. All of these stories have been uh, to give you some insight into how it was the crowd was growing and growing and growing so that when he comes back at Passover, you'll understand why it's so big. You know, so there's that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, 
And finally, we've reached it to the end of John chapter 10. I think it's, well, it's not the end, but it's our stopping point. Um, we're going to move on to some other stuff because we're doing, uh, what, what do we call it? Uh, time ordered. It's the word I'm looking for. Uh, chronological. Yeah, there you go. That chronological <laughs> walk through the gospels. So, uh, yeah, this is where we're stopping. Okie dokie. Oh! Thank you for listening to the Okie Dokie Most podcast. Please don't forget to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. And be sure to write us a rating and a review to let us know how this content is impacting your life. You can find out more information about the podcast at www.okidokimost.com. And please send us your questions or comments at the email address okidokimos at gmail.com. And until next time, we pray that you will do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. We'll talk to you again soon.